her video on and why she's doing that, I'll give her my introduction. Um, it's not all, always that we get the chairman and the CEO of Independent Bank on board. I'm always gl glad to have Susan come on board, the big boss over there at Independent Bank. Um, so first, thanks for sponsoring this. Uh, really appreciate that. But uh, I do have a couple questions for you, uh, Susan. How, any news in the banking world right now, anything that we as small business owners need to be advised on? I mean, interest rates going up, loans, anything you can, any, any inside scoop you could give us? Oh, I wish I had inside scoop, Brian, but I will tell you that, um, you know, the Fed has just recently announced at this moment that they are going to uh, be keeping rates low for a very long time. One of the things they want to do is give the economy a chance to heal. So for lots of folks out there, borrowers particularly, low rates are a real plus. Uh, one of the things I will say, though, for savers, people who um, have their money and have want their money to work for them, the challenge of low rates is that it's very difficult to find a way to make your money work for you as effectively as it has in the past. So um, I, will, I, I will tell you that we are, this is not a recovery that will be a speedy recovery. We understand that uh, the economy was really hitting on all cylinders before COVID-19. But we're gonna, it's gonna take a while to heal. And one of the things that the Fed has committed um, in their most recent minutes and in the conversations that we've had through both Chairman Powell and all of the Fed presidents is that we're gonna look at long, a long uh, runway of low interest rates and a focus on trying to make sure that we do everything we can to support the recovery of the economy. Um, there is one thing I would say though, there are only so many things that monetary policy is one of the weapons. We need fiscal policy, which is legislative, uh, to help us as well. So we hope that the folks that are in Washington will get to work on our behalf as well. Is, is there anything that you would ask small businesses to do to help Washington get involved and help out? I mean, is there any action items right now? You know, I tell people all the time, make sure that you communicate with your representatives, um, the things that are important to you and to your business. Uh, we are facing an unprecedented time and particularly, we're so proud to be a part of the small business council and the work that we do because our economy is built on small businesses as everyone knows we are uh, there are literally our our country is driven by thousands and thousands of small business owners who wake up every day and they are literally directly putting their lives and their livelihood on, on the line uh, so we need to make sure that we communicate what we need uh, it is difficult today uh, to have our legislators um, fully engaged on all the different fronts, but the more we share with them, the better off we are. So I tell everyone to make sure you know the name and uh, at least the email address of your congressional representative, your senator, not both at the state level and at the, at the national level. Uh, but then locally, we've got great people who are working here locally to try to help us as well. And I, and I tell people all the time, communicate with the people who are your partners in this. You have your bank, your accountants, um, your customers, those are the folks that you need to be talking to and um, giving them feedback on where you are and what you're doing. Well, I think, I think that that's really good advice. And I, I would also encourage the participants that I'm going to ask for a kind of a two-way conversation that if you see anything that the chamber, the business community needs to be doing to help leverage as you're paying attention to it, let us know because the chamber can enact people to contact the representatives, help out with that contact information. And likewise, to everyone joining us today, um, if you see something that the business community, the, the entire community needs to, for that matter, get involved to push for legislation on the state or federal level, let us know. Uh, that's, that's part of the chamber's job and, and we got great partners uh, like Independent Bank to help out with that. So, hey, thank you for once again thank sponsoring so this. We're hey, proud plus, to do it. And let's, let's keep going because I think people are getting a lot out of this. I did, thank you, um, Thanks. Susan. So, uh, in my haste, some people don't know who I am, and I just got yelled at on text messages about no one knows who you are. So uh, I, I'm Brian Stevens. I am the CEO of a public strategy company here in Memphis, uh, Tennessee, with offices in D.C. Um, and so I, I don't know what else to say. I'm on the board of the chamber, and that's uh, and I'm chair of the Small Business Council as as part of my job on the, the as a board member on the chamber. So that's why I'm doing this. So you guys will be done with me and six months or something like that. And somebody else will hopefully take this role on and, and keep it up. So that's who I am. Let's get to the meat of it. Uh, Mayor, if you could go ahead and unmute yourself, I'm going to tell stories about you that I want to tell to your face because that'll make me a lot happier. Um, so uh, the, Mayor Strickland just basically won re-election with what 
many would consider a landslide victory. Um, uh, I, I was happy to be the chief strategist of his transition team back in the day when he first took over. Uh, and I think Shay Flynn and I, if you can, anyone can remember that name, helped pull his ballot to, to get him to run. So that was, that was a lot of fun too. But the, here's the interesting thing about Mayor Strickland. He's got quite a sense of humor. You, you may not know it because he's all business and getting down with the fundamentals. Um, I ran for city council a hundred years ago. I think I was 14 years old, very young. And I made the runoff election and the, the mayor was a city, becoming a city council person. He'd won his election during that same time slot. And I was in a runoff. We knew I was going to lose in a runoff, but I was excited to have made the runoff as an, as an unknown. The mayor calls me up that afternoon when I, when I got the result. He's shaking his head because he remembers and he's embarrassed that he did it. And, and I, first call I took was a future councilman, Jim Strickland. And he's like, you, you doing all right, buddy? And I'm like, yeah, we knew. And he goes, how does it feel to be a loser? I'm a winner and you lost. And then he hung up the phone on me. I was devastated, mainly because four years early in that, I made fun of him for losing a race. And I think we all forget about that. But, you know, he, has, he did have one loss back in the day. So, Mayor, glad you're here now. You have dealt with some of the most complex issues that any mayor has ever dealt with from protests that, that didn't turn into riots. Uh, I want to talk to you about that. I want to talk to you a little bit about COVID-19. I, I think the only thing that you haven't had a massive, we haven't had an earthquake. So you, you got to have an earthquake before your cycle as mayor uh, ends and you would have dealt with everything as a mayor. So let me start with um, the, the kind of the first initiative is, and I don't want to have a COVID-19 hour long conversation or anything. And once again, if you have questions, Kim's already posted one, I'll get to that. You can post on the q and I'll be looking at that as the mirror's going through. First off, COVID-19, we're dealing with it. We're kind of shut down, kind of back up to business. And I know you don't have a crystal ball, but what are the indicators that we as small businesses should look for when you may have to make a decision about shutting us down or opening us back up? Okay, let me answer that in two ways. Uh, first, um, uh, I don't make those decisions. Uh, the, um, when we started uh, with COVID and back in March, uh, the city, we did lead the way and, and made some tough calls. But about two or three months ago, Governor Lee entered an order that applies statewide and he gave all the authority on whether something should be opened and under what conditions to the uh, health department. And the health department is a county entity, the Shelby County Health Department. So they have 100% control over that issue. Uh, but I can tell you what they look at. Um, number one, they, they talk to the doctors locally. Um, and they have doc experts on staff, uh, but they also work with University of Tennessee and then doctors in private uh, practice. And what they're looking at is the um, number of new cases every day, the positivity rate, which is the percent of the test done each and every day, um, uh, what percent that is, if it's generally, if it's over 10, it's, uh, it's of concern. If it's under 10, it's still too high. We, they'd like it under 5%, but, but they're, not, um, uh, they're not alarmed by something un under 10. And, and then hospitalizations. And remember when we first got into this, we wanted to avoid what had happened in Italy and then what we saw in New York, which was too many patients for our hospital systems to handle. And so the number of people in the hospital. Now saying all that, uh, we are in the best shape we've been um, uh, with, all these, with respect to all these numbers since June. Uh, and sometimes May, uh, we really peaked in a bad way in July, uh, right after 4th of July. Uh, but, but since then, uh, and, I, and I, there's a lot of reasons for it, but uh, that's also when we really, we passed a mask mandate and uh, we've, we've really went after enforcing it to the point where I think in Memphis, wearing a mask is the norm. And that's what we really wanted to make it. We wanted to wear a mask being the norm. We also pushed social distancing and washing your hands. But since then, 
our, our hospitalizations, for instance, are, are right now about 200. Uh, a few weeks ago, they were close to 400, 400 people in the hospital with uh, COVID-19. A uh, number of new cases now are, are generally between 100 and 150. And it wasn't that long ago, we were getting several hundred. Uh, our positivity rate uh, got to about 16%, and we're now down just under 10%. So everything's moving in the right direction. Um, uh, I don't think, um, I, I think if you wanted to know if, if Memphis or Shelby County ever had to lock down again, it would be because those numbers got up to where they were. Uh, you know, four or 500 people in the hospital. It's a hospital saying, we're, we're, we can't handle anymore. Uh, the, uh, remember with the alternative hospital the state built at uh, the old commercial appeal, that would be full. And um, I, maybe I'm an optimist, but I don't see that happening. I see people taking most, for the most part, taking this seriously and doing the right thing. Well, so um, one of the things that uh, Amy Daniels does with your Memphis Chamber um, is she sends out a report uh, about the, the cases. And so if you're not on that email, you may want to reach out to your chamber representative and get that just so you can, for your own business sake, start to look at those numbers that the mirror said. And that, that, that if, we're at, if we're, you start to see a spike of like four or 500 a day, that's when you should start thinking about potential business impact, right? But not, not until then. It's pretty much like it is right yeah, now. If, that's very, yeah, generally that's very true. Um, and, but there'll be a lot of noise if, if it really gets to that point where the old commercial appeal building is full. Um, uh, you can't, you couldn't miss it. It'll be that, it'll be that discussed. Okay. Well, I think that, that at least gives me some solace. We're, we're debating in our office right now. We're still broken up into thirds. We have a third of the team coming in every day and there's some rotating schedule and it's been going all right, but we're starting to get people wanting to come back. So um, we're, we're still trying to please how to, how to deal with that. So, um, I've gotten a lot of questions about the city budget. Now, I know that we do our budget cycle. We just wrapped one up. It was end of June. Uh, I guess that's by charter. And so the next budget will be next year, wrapped up by before July 1st for the city budget. And there's been some concerns about the pressure that COVID may have had on, on the city's budget. And can we expect tax increases? I, I mean, what is it? Do we have any idea what that looks like yet? Sure. Let me start generally. Um, uh, as I was on the council for eight years. I've been mayor for four and a half years. Um, I truly believe that our, our relatively high property tax rate is a negative toward Memphis. Um, when we're 60% higher than Nashville, we're a lot higher than our neighboring counties. I think it, it, it is a, a detriment to try to grow this city. So I've worked really hard uh, to not support any property tax hike. I, I've never taken a pledge not to raise taxes, but I think it would hurt Memphis overall if we had to do that. Uh, just like private businesses were hurt, city government was hurt too with COVID. Uh, our fiscal, as Brian said, our fiscal year ended June 30th and we lost roughly $20 million uh, in, in revenue, maybe 25 out of basically a $700 million operating budget. Um, uh, we were able to make that up with some federal money, some state help, uh, and our, our reserves, uh, our rainy day fund. Going into this current budget, we estimated we were gonna lose 60 to $80 million, and we were able to plug the gaps the same way. Basically, we just kept the same budget uh, that we had last year and just filled the holes we, with, the, with this help from federal, state, and our reserves. Um, it would, if it happens, if, if, this, if this goes into the next year's budget, um, uh, it, will, it would all depend on whether we could get state or federal help because uh, we could probably take more out of our, our reserves, but you get to a point where, um, it, you don't want them too low. So um, I don't anticipate a property tax increase. There's not going to be any cut in services this year, uh, but there's no improved services either. It's just kind of a status quo budget this year. Well, it, it's funny that you, you mentioned, you know, 
our tax rates, but the, the, the county tax rate is really the one that's so much higher than the other 95 counties in the state. I know you don't control the county budget. I know you have a good relationship with Mayor Harris and you used to serve with him on the council. It, it, it does strike me as interesting that of the top 10 highest taxed municipalities, city governments in the state, we have seven, basically just there's seven municipalities and it's all based on the county tax rate. Is there, have, I'm trying to figure out, is there any conversations between the county, or are there, are there any looking at, you know, a, a coming together with the city and the county governments to really talk about the overall tax increase and budget, or is that still kind of a distinct? Yeah, there's not, uh, there's not that much overlap. Um, the county handles um, uh, the jail, uh, they have a prison, the court system and education and health, and then we handle most other uh, municipal functions. So there's not that much over uh, uh, that we have in common. You know, there's little things like they have an engineering department, we have an engineering department. Uh, those could be combined, like the Office of Planning Development was combined years and years ago. I don't think it would net all that much. Um, but you're right, the county tax uh, rate is $4 and something, and ours is uh, Four or two, yeah. three, $3. So the, the, it is the county, but but the taxpayer doesn't know the difference. They're paying over $7 combined tax rate, which is still you know 50% higher than what you would pay in Nashville. Yeah, so um, we, we got a question kind of related to this. Is there, at some point you have reserves and you need reserves for your bond ratings and, and things like this. And we, we had some big projects kind of on the queue that needs bonds. Is there any plan to start to try to, have you guys even started thinking about rebuilding those reserves or yeah. uh, is there a plan there? Now, let me, let me answer that also. I want to point out the fact that our, our estimates on re, reduced revenue was basically sales taxes and those kind of fees. Um, and in March, April, May, uh, we did uh, sustain reduced revenue. Um, interestingly, though, um, uh, June, we received more sales taxes in June of 2020 than we did June of 2019. So um, we don't know for sure whether this, this negative impact that we all anticipated would be quite as bad as we anticipated. But uh, we generally try to keep our uh, reserves, our rainy day fund at 10% of our operating budget. Pre-coronavirus, uh, uh, we had roughly an $85 million reserve with a $700 million budget. Uh, depending on how this year goes, if we have to use all the reserves that we anticipated we had to do in, in back in May and June when we put this budget together, we'll be down in the 50s. But if the economy uh, and the sales taxes continue to be collected like they were in June and our losses don't materialize, uh, uh, we won't hit that, that uh, $50 million figure. Yeah, and I, I think that I think you're right from the taxpayers, the small business aspect of it. We care, is our tax rate going to go up and do we need to start playing on that? And, and I, I, I think, you know, hopefully not, right? Hopefully not. And I, we probably need to have uh, Amy, Mayor Harris, and maybe some county commissioners on to talk about that side of the fence also at some point so we can anticipate those kind of tax increases also. And I will say, that, I mean, uh, I'm not pushing for a tax increase, but we are, uh, even pre-COVID, we're um, razor thin on on our budget. Where if if I'm a swimmer, this water the water is just right below uh, my mouth because uh, I told you about a seven hundred million dollar budget, but on average, our revenue growth is only about one point four percent. Yeah, 10 million, ten million dollars a year, and let me put that in perspective: a one percent pay raise to all city employees is four point five million. So that's almost half of our normal revenue growth. Just like y'all, our healthcare costs go up, our, 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 our retirement uh, costs go up. This year, this current budget year, our retirement costs, we have to put in money every year, was the increase was $8 million. So we are not flush with cash. We are uh, really eking out uh, all that we can on very limited growth. So I, I want to I kind of stay in the budget topic just for one more minute. 
is that we know that governments are designed to provide services cost effectively because you, you pull resources, right? You said that there's probably no plan this year to decrease services, but at some point, I, we know that you've, you cut a lot of fat out when you first got there and even your predecessor started trimming the, the fat quite a bit. Can, what happens? I mean, do we get reduced services? And I want to start getting into police a little bit. So maybe we talk, maybe we keep the conversation around police because there's a recent poll that came out about Metro government. And um, um, one thing that was clear in that poll, Mr. Mayor, was crime was no longer above a 50% concern in the city. And so that the fear of crime has gone down, but with the potential to defund police movements that we've seen nationally, um, I mean, I know you want to have more, there's a big push to train the officers more, train, 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 like we did in the army that you still have the budgets to train and you still need more officers. So what, what's gonna happen with policing and crime and, and the budget? And, uh. Well, let me set the stage on that just to explain. We have roughly uh, uh, 2,100 officers. We had an analysis done about how many officers do we need? And it came back at, um, uh, 2,800 officers. We need 2,800 officers and we have roughly 2,100. So we have two thirds of what we need. We need 700 new officers. One of the reasons we need so many uh, is our city is so large geographically. We're 340 square miles. Uh, we're roughly 650,000 people, which is almost identical to Boston. Boston's uh, about 670,000 people. But while we're 340 square miles, Boston is 50 square miles. Geographically, we're larger than Chicago. Geographically, we're larger than, than New York. We are very spread out and it's, it's hard to deliver services, which as a side note, is, the, is one, of the, one of the two big reasons our public transportation system is subpar, is, is just the so geographic size of our city. Um, so, uh, but combine that with the, the, the reform uh, movement that's going on across the country. Um, and I think we can find um, this could be assistance to the police department. We have expected so much of police departments over the years where they respond to every what we call mental consumer call. They respond to every traffic accident. They respond to every um, domestic dispute call. Every call that comes into 911, some of the thought process you see here around the country is should, uh, should others respond to some of those calls? Instead of um, commissioned officers, maybe uh, some mental health care uh, workers could respond to, to the mental consumer calls. And just let's take that for example. It's not an easy issue, by the way, uh, and, and Memphis has a really good crisis intervention team model. But if it was a nonviolent call, um, that might be good. So we might not need 2,800 officers. It might be 2,700, 2,600, uh, if we can shift some of those responsibilities to lay people or, or trained experts. But bottom line is, I want you all to know, and I, this is what I've tried to convey to the council, we're still going to need hundreds more officers. And if there's any, there should be no doubt that in Memphis, at least, the number of police officers we've had has a direct correlation to the rate of crime. Um, we, we've mapped it out. If you're on my, e Brian mentioned email from uh, the chamber. I send out an email every Friday and we put this graph out many times. We were up to over 2,400 officers in 2011. That was also the most recent low in crime. And as we lost officers after 2011, our crime rate went up. When we took office and really went after recruiting officers and our number of officers slowly started to creep back up over the last two years, our crime rate has gone down. Now I will say during uh, the pandemic here, our violent crime rate has increased. Um, and, and we could talk about that too, if you want to, Brian. But, but in general, in Memphis, the more police, now it won't wipe out crime, but it can help reduce crime. And 
you know, crime is an issue. It's much more than just policing, but policing is a key component. So I think I'm back on right now, Jim. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. And you're back on. Did you get dropped or was it just my service at Clark? I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Great. Well, we'll, we'll, Brian, we'll deal with the Brian, it was only you. It was only you, Brian. Thanks. But glad right. that you're well, back. <laughs> that's great. I'm glad it was just me. And hopefully uh, we don't see anybody else get lost. But I'm glad the mayor just kind of kept moving along with all these, these issues. So um, I'm going to take it that we're done with the police conversation right now. And that you gave a, a, a good <laughs> lawyer political answer on all those things. One of the issues that did come up was domestic violence and, and, and the, the rise of um, – <laughs> you know, what do they call it? More yeah, aggravated crime. type crimes, violent crimes, violent crimes. What are you guys looking at for that to make sure that that doesn't bubble over? Sure, Memphis, like most big cities in America has seen an increase in violent crime during the pandemic. Uh, I am no expert, uh, but my, uh, my observation is that during the last six months during this pandemic, for young people, and young people are the drivers of violent crime, ages 16 to 24. It was this, that way pre-pandemic and it's during the pandemic, 16 to 24. But during the pandemic, all the positive interventions, school, sports, community centers, uh, mentoring, um, all those have been eliminated or greatly reduced their impact. Uh, church, church activities, youth group, all those positive outlets have been greatly decreased. Plus, our service industry has had to lay off thousands of Memphians. So thousands of, not only the service industry, but a lot of thousands of people have lost their job. I think those two things combined um, have greatly increased our violent crime rate. I will say that most uh, the most horrific violent crimes, it involves people who do know each other, either through family relations or, or, um, or transactional relations. But um, it doesn't make it any better, uh, but uh, it's just a fact. And it's just been a, a, it's tough. And it's really tough if person A who knows person B commits a violent act on person B, it's really hard for police to intercept that because they know each other. Uh, police have no advanced warning of that. And murders in particular are, are the crime that's least affected by the number of police officers. I talked about the number of police officers having a positive influence on driving down crime. Murder is, is not one of them. Yeah, and, and I think we've seen that nationally, but it, it is, a, a, I think, a pretty good takeaway for me is that I have a 15 year old daughter. You have children right around the same age. And um, if they, if they're bored, they can get into trouble. Maybe it's just in internal household trouble. But if you were a child like I was, and we, we live in just some section eight housing and stuff, we'd go and get into like mischief for real. And the there's a big difference between when you and I were younger and now, now those, that 16 to 24 year old, they have weapons. They have guns. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I try not to, it's a very politically divisive issue. Uh, there's no doubt about it. But the, I asked our police director, who's been on the job for about 30 years as a police officer, I said, compare the number of guns on the street now, as opposed to 30 years ago. He said it's night and day. He said it was very rare that they would find a young person with a gun 30 years ago. A lot of them have guns now. Mayor, is there anything that you would you would ask of the community to help out with, with this right now? Well, it's tough because we're limited in our act, interaction with young people. Um, uh, well, number one, uh, parents need to step up and family members need to step up and intervene in the lives of their own young people. And who are they hanging out with? Do they have guns? And, and those folks who, who, who don't have young people or, and most of the people on this call, um, uh, uh, what I would ask them to do is support financially those organizations that are still, despite the pandemic, 
interacting with young people and trying to hug them in uh, because um, we, you know, they have access to guns, but we have to change their heart and their mind so they don't get access to those guns. That's, I think I think that's good advice, Mayor. Let's let's switch the subject really quickly. We got a question about the census, and I just to frame the conversation. Every ten years, we do a census, and the amount of mu- people that are counted in uh, in the community. Uh, means you get more state and federal resources. So for every family, you get more stuff. Now, I know that the federal government had a big push, and we'll call that an air campaign for a long time. And I know that the city has an initiative and the chamber, a lot of different people are pushing for that right now. Can you kind of give us an update on what the city is doing as far as getting our census count numbers up? Sure. We've we've been working on it since uh, actually about a year ago. We kicked off this effort, allocated some money to do some air strikes, uh, radio, TV, um, uh, pinging, pinging your phone, um, uh, directing those. Uh, we've uh, put people out on the streets to try to gather. We, you know, we can't take the census because you have to be a the federal census worker to do that, but to just drive interest. Um, we appreciate the chamber getting involved to try to um, uh, shake the bushes too, to get people involved. Uh, it is a huge issue. Every city across the country, rural um, or, or big or, or urban, is struggling with it because, you know, the traditional census uh, worker knocking on your door and interacting with you and filling out the form, we got a pandemic going on. Now, they're still out there, but it's just greatly reduced their impact. So, thankfully, the federal government said we can do it online, but we have a large portion of our population who doesn't have access. So what we've done is we've opened up our libraries who have uh, at least three uh, laptops or computers dedicated at each branch to helping people fill out the census and there'll be somebody there to help you actually fill it out. So we're trying to drive people to to one of our libraries which are all over the city. We've just, so what I'd ask y'all to do, if just a couple things, make sure everyone at your business has filled out the online census. They have till the end of this month. Um, and then send an email out to all your friends and family uh, to fill that out. It, on the online, it takes 10 minutes. Yeah, and, and I will say um, every, or rowing in the same direction to try to build these numbers up because we left a lot of money, federal money on the table for the last decade. Some people estimate as much as $70 million, which you know goes to a lot of programs. So um, let me tell you what the chambers doing to help you out. Beverly Robertson has been uh, our CEO who's going to close us out today. I'm kind of excited she's going to join us, is that um, they have teams in place that will come to your business or, or they have structures for draft emails to send to your people to push them to do it. If you want to have somebody come to your office or do a Zoom call like this, the chamber has teams that will do that and walk your, your, your employees through how to actually fill out the census. And it only takes about four or five minutes and it's all online and they can even bring laptops and all that stuff. So if you think you need help at your business to get people to fill out the census and bring a lot more money uh, to our community, go ahead and email Amy Daniels or me and we'll get that scheduled. And it's, um, uh, I, I think you probably have Amy's email and she'll funnel it to the right people right now or, or Detunja on this and it'll get sent and we'll get a team over there to help you fill out that census. And so the more the merrier right now. And actually our population in the city, Mayor, according to the census estimates has gone down since 2010, right? So it's even, well, you know, is that well, true or not true? But, but well, they're I estimating mean, it's down. But that's been true of Memphis since the sixties. Yeah, yeah. The population well. of Memphis has decreased for 50 years. And uh, in fact, I often talk about that being our number one challenge in Memphis is the loss of population. No business, no religious institution, no civic club can handle long-term loss of residents or uh, customers. Uh, but that's for, a, that's for another hour-long conversation. Yeah, and it's, 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 it's interesting. I, uh, I, we've only got a couple minutes left, Mayor. I did get a question about what the chances of metro government are. And I know that just to frame everybody out, there, there was a poll. Uh, it, it got baked out in the news on the, uh, of the potential for a metro government to be passed. And we can have another uh, call about that if people want to kind of dig into that a little bit. But the number one driver that people said they wanted were jobs, city, county, 
across the board, we need more economic opportunities. We know that we've got a tough, tough haul on that. Any and anything you can think of right now that initiatives that this community can help out with to, to push jobs, 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 jobs. Well, I'm, I'm for consolidation. There's no doubt. I think uh, uh, speaking with one voice, whether it's a, a single mayor or a single legislative body helps. And I say that even though I had a great relationship with Mayor Luttrell and I have a great relationship with uh, Mayor Harris, there's no problems there at all. It's just you have two people involved in economic. I talked earlier about county government being separate from city, but economic development is 50-50. And it's just, you can move more nimbly and more and faster and, uh, and sometimes speed helps in these things. So I just, that's one example, economic development of, of operating with a single voice. I'm a real believer in accountability. And, um, and when you have one person in charge, that person is held accountable. So what people could do is, is investigate it. I think y'all should have a monthly meeting and go over that poll. But many people forget we tried this uh, issue about 10 years ago. It did not succeed. There are some folks who think it has a better shot this time. Um, but it, it takes a whole entire community because the people in Memphis have to vote yes. And then the people in the suburbs separately have to vote yes. Yeah, and that's, and that's one thing that's really important, but you know, the, the interesting thing about the poll and if people want to hear more about it, we can have another uh, call about this is people, city, county, we're all one. It didn't matter if you're white, black, Republican, or Democrat. The number one driver was, man, we, we got to have better economic opportunities. You can tell Mayor, I've been talking a lot today already. <laughs> um, so, but, but you look at, and you know this, Brian, you look at cities have, over the last 30 years who've done really well economically, Nashville, Jacksonville, Louisville, they've all consolidated. Well, yeah, and is it the right for us? And I, I'm really curious about exploring that. And I'll tell everyone out there listening is the earliest an election could be for this would be 2022. So what a great time to, to explore opportunities to grow our economic engine. Maybe it's metro government, maybe it's not, but it is worth saying that we've got to rise that prosperity rank. So a couple takeaways. I'm going to ask Beverly Robertson, our CEO of the Memphis Chamber, to, to unmute herself and to bring her camera on as I kind of start wrapping it up and turning it over to her. Is that, is that, look, if you haven't done the census, call your chamber representative. We'll get somebody. The chamber will get somebody out there to help you. That, that crime, focus on those kids. Let's donate money to the organizations that are trying to, to, to make sure that they're growing as best they can. I thought that was a great takeaway. And, and look, you know, I am proud of the job that the, the, the Memphis Police Department has done with doing their best. Protests are awesome. I've been involved in a lot of protests, but we didn't have the issues a lot of other cities did. And that's through a lot of different people get credit for that. So I'm going to turn it over to the CEO of the Memphis Chamber, R. Beverly Robinson. And thank you, Mayor, for coming on board and, and spending some time. We'll get you back out here. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brian. I really appreciate you moderating uh, our discussion for today. And Mayor, I really appreciate your remarks and the kind of job that you have done in, under such incredible uh, circumstances. These have been incredibly challenging times and uh, I think you have done a really good job of trying to keep us informed about what is going on. And certainly that has really uh, impacted our business community to a great extent. None of this would really be possible without a sponsor. And we so appreciate Independent Bank for stepping in to sponsor these Small Business Council meetings because I too agree uh, with Susan's comments earlier that small businesses are the engine that drive Memphis forward and in fact this nation forward. So um, we want to continue to keep our businesses informed and up to date on information. And speaking of information, Mayor, I just have one other thing I'd like for you to, to just share with them. Uh, the city just recently announced uh, a small business grant program. Uh, and I thought that was awesome. I appreciate it. And since you've got a lot of small businesses <laughs> on the line, 
who might need to access that. Can you share a little bit about that before we say our final goodbyes? Sure. Um, uh, the federal government it gave Memphis and every city over 500,000 people um, CARES Act funds uh, and uh, to help uh, businesses and organizations who are suffering because of uh, coronavirus losses. Uh, so uh, what we did, we set up a couple programs with, in partnership with the city council. And this, the one that we just announced, I think it was three or $4 million, We'll, we'll give grants between ten and $25,000. Uh, you know, you do have to be a, a business in Memphis, but, um, uh, and uh, we're gonna administer that and hopefully give it all out. It's not as, it's not as significant as the, the, uh, uh, the federal government programs, but they have a lot more money. So, but it's something to help, uh, and it's only for small businesses. Uh, if you have any questions about it, please call my office at 576-6000, 576-6000, and we will uh, connect you to those resources. There's several different programs. In fact, the county has one too, but if you call us, we can get you to uh, the right one. Thank you, Beverly, for mentioning that. Thank you, Beverly. And certainly, if you access that program, because I know a lot of small businesses are suffering, some of our schools are closed, some are fully closed. Hey, Beverly, Beverly, I think something's wrong with your audio. We can't hear you. It's very garbled. All right, thank you, Beverly. You and I both that were having issues today. We don't have the topic for next month yet, but we'll be getting that out. So please check your email. And if you have ideas, for topics that you want, send them in. Uh, I, we'd, we'd love to get the feedback. So thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank our sponsors as always. Awesome job. Uh, Tanja, Amy Daniels, you're awesome sauce. And Beverly, thanks for coming in and closing us out today. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in one month. Appreciate it.